Welcome everyone to our Spring 2022 series of OTF Connects webinars entitled Supporting Teacher Efficacy and Student Engagement. My name is Peter Beans and I'm honored to be your moderator for today's session with Cameron Stellman and Rich Parker entitled Re-Energizing the Junior Classroom. I'd like to begin with doing a, a land acknowledgement. We acknowledge we are gathered in the traditional territories of various Indigenous peoples, and we further recognize our duty to support the achievement of the calls to actions stemming from the recommendations of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada. Please allow me to welcome Cameron Stellman and Rich Parker. An 11th year teacher with the Halton District School Board, Cameron has enjoyed many different roles in the classroom. Over the course of his career, he has been a teacher librarian, taught kindergarten through grade seven, as well as technology integration and computational thinking. Cameron was featured on TVO's Power Hour of Learning and CBC's The National for his work with computational thinking in the classroom. Cameron is an AQ instructor with ETFO in e-learning, integration of ICT in the classroom and library. A frequent presenter for both ETFO and the Ontario Teachers Federation, Cameron has had the privilege of working with amazing educators across the province. Cameron is a passionate educator whose motto is engage, inspire, learn. And he strives to bring this with him in both his presentations and his daily teaching practice. Cameron can be found on Twitter at, at Mr. Steltman. Rich has been an educator with the Halton District School Board for 18 years. He has taught primarily in the junior and intermediate divisions and has held roles as a self-contained behavior resource teacher, self-contained learning disabilities teacher, CERT, and spent two years at Trillium Demonstration School. No matter the role, there have always been two constants, special education and technology. Rich is a frequent presenter for ETFO and OTF and has delivered workshops that focus on helping educators find ways to integrate technology into all aspects of the curriculum. Rich strives to ensure that the things he shares are innovative, engaging, and useful for all students, no matter what their needs. Find Rich on Twitter at Teacher Parker. So now let's turn it over to Cameron and Rich. Welcome. All right, thank, thank you, you all very much. much. All right, RP, do you want me to? You go ahead and start because you're the gate first. You're the first. I'll click these check marks and woof, look at this. Thanks for everyone while cameras been set up. Thanks for everyone for joining us tonight. We know it's uh, near the end of the year, it's uh, after school, but uh, we do appreciate uh, when people can find time to take these courses and um, continue learning, right? Lifelong learners. Agreed. So I've just popped the chat um, or the, I know the same link keeps coming out again and again and again, but I just want to make sure that everybody has access to our slideshow, should you want it. So yeah, welcome to re-energizing your classroom with uh, myself and Richard. Um, you can see here, these are live links that you can um, use if you wish to follow us or check us out on Twitter. Um, I can pop those in the chat as well. Um, and then we will get ourselves started. So here we go. Um, as we've heard a whole introduction on us, and those are definitely still us. So we like to start out with a quote, which says here, adversity shakes the foundation of our character to see if what we believe and value is really worth standing up for. And that's from Ray Smith. And so I like to relate this quote really to just how the pandemic and kind of certain forces perhaps in government have really been shaking the core of education. We've seen we've seen funding get stripped away. We've seen just really a real hard, it's been a hard time to be a teacher, I would say. Um, and I think what we're seeing now, and especially what we're seeing here with everybody who signed up for this, is that teachers realize that public education is worth standing up for. And it's going to be hard and it's going to be difficult. But by making this choice to continue your learning and choosing to be here with us today, you're standing up for public education and for your students and saying that you're here to make make it better for them. So we really, really, really appreciate you all being here. Um, with that said, we wanna get started. So something I've been doing a lot with my students, um, I teach grade four this year, um, is getting, we have been integrating exercise in a variety of different ways. Attention spans seem to have shrunk um, and I'm finding that I need to really bring my kids back 
um, regularly. So therapy is an amazing resource to get students moving, thinking about mental and physical wellness. We know that through science that exercise enhances learning. So we're going to work through an exercise together. But before we do, I just want to show you what we do in our class. Right now we are working through challenges. We do 30 day challenges. There's well over 150 in here. And what I do is I pick three or four. I show them to the students. And then because of voice and choice, students choose which one we're going to work through for the week. Uh, or for the month, and then we do it for 30 days. So we've done the daily squats challenge and we went through, and by the end we were just doing a ridiculous amount of squats. So it's been a lot of fun. Um, and because students have some say in which ones get chosen, it's really, really cool. They also have meal plans and those sorts of things if you wanted to integrate it for health, which I think is kind of cool. Um, but the nice thing I like is just the workouts. So inside of workouts, if you ever need a quick break, they've got a whole bunch of different ones here. So what we are going to do is we'll just pick the first one, force of nature. And we can see here that normally you would be doing three sets. We are not going to be doing that, but I would ask that you join me along as we try to figure this out. So apologies if the camera isn't absolutely perfect, but we're going to start out with 20 butt kicks just to get ourselves going. So I'm going to just twist it a bit and here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, five jump squats. Here we go. One. I can't raise my arms in the head sky because I will go through my ceiling. Four, five, and high knees. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, front kicks. One, we're only doing ten. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and ten punches. One, two, three, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And you can tell we didn't even do the full thing. I'm already out of, out, of, oh, out of breath. My goodness. So just a fun way to get students excited about exercise and just something neat to get them integrated into that whole thing. All right, Rich, did you want to tell us about the plan? Yeah, so I have like no room here. It's always my excuse when Cameron does that and I don't because I'm in a very small spare bedroom with limited room. So thanks, Cameron, for taking that on. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to do um, a little talk about student choice. Um, again, as many of you will have known or experienced, um, giving student choice is more engaging. Studies show that. Evidence in your own personal classroom shows that. So we're going to talk a bit about student choice. And you went too far there, Cameron. I know. <laughs> and then Cameron's going to, um, so I'm going to kind of start with some student choice for the, is that better? Um, I do not have a good microphone here. Can you hear me, Shelly? I will speak really loud. Um, so I'm going to start talking about choice in mostly the language classroom and then how you can take some of that um, stuff that I'm going to share and move it across to other classrooms. Cameron's going to jump in after that and take over some creativity integration and coding. So he's going to look at Scratch and some of the many great things that he has done with Scratch. And if we have time at the end, because we have prepared this for a longer session than today, but we're hoping to fit in some Google uh, art activities at the end and some other little things. The great thing about this slideshow is that if we do not get into everything, you are going to have a ton of live links that you can explore at your own um, at your own level your and at your own discretion and um, see what you can learn from there. So I'm going to take over the sharing, Cameron. You go, amigo. Do I have to stop it first? Nope, we're good. All right. All right. So I'm going to jump in here at this reading choice board that we're going to talk about. So, um, reading choice boards, this is something that I have used um, many times um, for many different texts that we've been working on in my classroom. And Cameron has um, taken it as well and used it. So, he'll jump in with some of his experiences. Where we got this from was a great um, website um, that the name is living my mind right now, um, but it will come. Oh yeah, uh, Dish Set Textbook right there at the bottom. Um, we got it from Dish Set Textbook, which has a lot of great, really fantastic resources that are engaging, built a lot around a lot of the social media um, things that we have. So we're gonna show some examples, but what does a reading choice board look like? Um, so here is the example here. So when you click on that, it is going to force you to make a copy. One make. 
spinning, so it is going to make it eventually. There we go. So here is the reading choice board. We took this from, I believe, Slides Carnival um, or Slides, Slides Mania. Mania. Slides Mania. Yeah, if you're looking for a great resource, slidesmania.com has got lots of um, even like teacher focused ones and they are still free. Whereas Slides Go and Slides Carnival have kind of moved into a more freemium model where things get a little bit more expensive than I. Right. Um, so this is the choice board that we, we I took. Um, I put my little instructions here. I learned that from my class, students with learning disabilities, four activities was a lot for them to do as they work through their novel. So um, we peeled that back to three. Um, I share this um, through Google Classroom so everyone gets their own copy. And this is sort of the main page where they, they go from. Um, these numbers are all links. So this will take them to the connections. I'm not gonna explain connections because that's you know something that's not using some of the tools that we have. You guys know enough about connections. But I will talk about the Netflix retail and I'll show you some examples. I'll talk about the amazing artifacts because that's kind of neat. I'll talk about the Facebook status and Instagram story, the makeup meme, which is really uh, something the kids love. And again, as you're seeing these, you, you'll be able to sort of connect some dots and see where else you can use this in the curriculum. But what happens here is if I want to check out what the Netflix retail instructions are, the student goes there and they get the instructions of what they have to do on the Netflix retail. So if you choose this activity, you have to write a chapter, a retail for each chapter or section of the book. You have to make a trailer. Um, that was optional for me. Um, you have to have books that might be similar to yours and some character traits. So here is the actual template. So again, it's gonna instruct you to make a copy. And here is what the template looks like. And I'll show you what this looks like um, in a minute what it, what, when we've worked on it. So um, this here image can be, this image here can be changed by clicking on it and replace image. So for example, if the students are doing, let's say Harry Potter, they click on here and search the web. And if I type in Harry Potter, up come some images that we might look at and I'm gonna click this one here. And it changes that background image to the Harry Potter um, one that I chose. And then all these can be edited. So I might choose the Harry Potter, whatever book I'm doing. And here would be where they describe, where they type a little description. When I talked about chapter summaries, um, this is where that would happen on sort of the episodes page. And um, what they would do is, you know, you might not want to do every chapter for a bigger book because it's a lot. So you might ask them to do groups of chapters. You might ask them to choose depending on their level of independence. Um, and they can put images in here as well. So if they would put chapter one here maybe, and then they would write a retell about chapter one. What Cameron started doing with his class is um, they were responsible to start um, creating their own images for this section here. So instead of doing the search like we showed you, they would um, go insert image from the camera. It might not take because my camera is being um, used right now for the webcam. Um, but what would happen here is it would see a picture of me um, holding up whatever picture I've drawn, and then I take the picture and it inserts in there. So. That's a really also, underrated tool, um, insert image camera. I do it for um, other work as well. If a kid's doing math that's digital, but they want to do some working it out on their pencil um, on paper, I use that tool for that too. So that's really neat as well. Cameron, you were going to jump in there? Yeah, I was also saying um, with Google Drive and Google Photos, it's super easy to integrate, like taking like good pictures, because I do find the, the the webcam photo can be a bit dicey and my students weren't super happy, like if it would have like their fingers in it. So they we got to the point where because they were grade sixes, we were able to really like use Google Drive, upload a photo and drag and, and do that replace image with photos they'd created. And it, it it's awesome. Like it is it's amazing what they can do. And because it's Netflix, it really does get that buy in from our students. That's right. Um, so again, if they can take pictures on their phone of the work, um, other ways, I've got a ton of different um, webcams and or, um, yeah, IPVO cameras um, that my school isn't using as much anymore. So I hold those in my room too. So there's lots of different ways that you can integrate those images. Now, what happens here is if you are in a book that has more than four chapters, before they start typing or they're going to do a bunch of editing, they can just go slide duplicate 
and it will duplicate the slides so they can add as many chapters as they need here. Again, if they duplicate after they filled in or started filling in the work here, then they just have a little bit more editing to themselves to do. Um, down here is if you do have access to um, maybe iMovie or if they make a movie of their own, they can put a little trailer in here. Um, we did not have that access last year, so I actually deleted that slide. So that's the other great thing about a lot of what Cameron and I are going to share today. You can make it your own. So I would delete this slide. So that's what, that's what we would say is we really want you to make it your own. We're here to give you some ideas and some inspiration. They could definitely use a screencastify there. That's what we're talking about. And Lisa, thanks so much for jumping in with that. It's the whole thing here is we want to say these things have really worked or really inspired our students. Um, and then we saw that and we took it and we ran with it and we share it. But that's why we put it out to incredible educators like the ones we have here is that you're going to take it and make it and come up with cool ideas that are going to make it yours. That's going to make it really special for your students. We didn't make this Netflix template. We're not saying we did, um, but we have used it to great effect. And we're hoping that you can do the same kind of collating and, and taking all the key stuff saying this has all worked well for us. Here's some ideas for how you could use it as well. Sorry, Rich. Yeah, because the, the trailer like with Screencastify is a great idea because it doesn't need to be a trailer per se. It could be them giving a verbal um, review of the, the, the movie or the book or whatever it is. So it doesn't have to be just the, 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 the trailer. Um, and then the last little part here, we talked about like they could put in a, uh, you know, a character and just come up with a quick description about the character. And again, you could change this as to, you know, whatever you want to. So again, this is where it's all really malleable. You can make this how you want. So when we look at some examples, so here's one we did in my classroom. Um, I used Martin Luther King book um, that we'd read on online last year, and we kind of walked through um, a little chapter summaries about what happened in, to his life. We found some, I did this part because the students didn't have exactly the, like a lot of the background knowledge. So this was one that we worked together so they could see. So when I modeled what it looked like for them. So that's just sort of what they, um, they did. This is one that we did for Fish in a Tree. So again, um, we got the quick introduction to Fish in a Tree there, Meet Ali, Smart Girl, et cetera, et cetera. And then we went through the chapters here as well. So Again, lots of neat little ways to use this. Um, and again, you're all great educators. Maybe you can find ways to use it beyond a textbook. All right, so on the next thing on the, sorry, I'm gonna shrink out of this, go back to here. On the retail next, I'm sorry, on the, um, the reading next was the amazing artifacts. Um, this is something where we just talked about, um, so again, it's not necessarily a template, but it's just, um, something that the students can do, choosing five important things from the story and explain why they are important. They can make them, they can create them on a slideshow, they can add to this slideshow. Um, so for example, in The Fish in the Tree, Wooden Nickel was an important artifact because Allie referred to a lot of time, her dad was a collector of coins, her grandfather was, and they referred to Wooden Nickel Day as sort of a bad day. So that might be an amazing artifact. Um, the next one, that we really liked here was the, I, I'm gonna skip over the Facebook, fake book. Um, if we wanna come back to it, Cameron, we can, but the Instagram template is one that's really um, a favorite in my room. So again, it will ask you to make a copy. Um, and uh, while we're waiting for it to make the copy, the great thing about this, um, this, this choice board is that we're giving you some there, but you might not wanna put them out there. So we changed it up. So I've got a text messaging one that I put in sometimes. Um, we've got an art one that's a bit different sometimes. We, we're changing what our six cho choices are. You may have some students who, you, you know, retail was really hammered home first term, so you want to do it second term, so you or you don't want to do it second term. So you take the retail off of there and you put something else in. You have all these great little resources that you already use. You might want to slip one of those in. But here is the Instagram um, story. So again, there's 10 different um, slides that are all the same. Off the, off the Instagram phone, um, capture screen, background, whatever you want to call it. And again, they would just put some images in there with a little message to retell the story. I'm um, working on sequencing, working on just very quick, brief ways to, um, to tell you what happened in a story. Again, this could be used for a historical event. Um, this could be used to summarize their week as a reflection. There's lots of different ways to use this. And what this looks like when we get to it, is the examples are right here. So this is one that my student did last year. One of my students um, 
you know, Allie has dyslexia and she can't read. So they found this image online and her message was it doesn't make sense. And that's what that part was. Um, Alice in Wonderland, miss you. Um, his grandfather or her grandfather read her Alice in Wonderland all the time. It was her favorite book, but her grandfather passed away. So she was connecting her, their favorite book with the miss you. Um, and this one was really neat. Sorry, it took so long. I conferenced with a student about this and he said to me, it has two meetings. I'm sorry it took for so long for me to read Alice in Wonderland or for Allie to read Alice in Wonderland by herself, but also sorry it took so long for me to, you know, or for Allie to get over her fear of reading and get back to um, learning how to read. So it was kind of neat to see the connections that some of the students made when they were doing this. So that's kind of how that can look. So you do have a full student example in the resource folder that we will share later on. All right, and the last one we'll talk about in this one, um, making a meme. This is one of my favorites that um, I go to. So the students really like this one here. And again, we do it for all sorts of things. Um, we do it for like, you know, heading into the long weekend, heading into, you know, March break, um, you know, heading into the test. So here's some examples um, my class did. So I have a saying in class on Thursdays in my class, most of them hate it when I call Thursday Friday Junior. So that's been an ongoing joke for a couple of years um, with my class. Um, there's one they did for summer vacation. We just did a bunch of different ones for a sample um, to share with you guys last year. Um, when Mr. Parker says there's two weeks left of school. So how do we create this? Well, you'll have a, a blank example of this. And what happens here on a slide is um, the people who made this made it very simple for us. All you do, so how I share this is, I share this with the whole class if I'm doing like a common meme. If I'm only sharing it with uh, one student um, to do a couple of memes from their book, I might only have two or three of these slides there. But if I'm sharing with the whole class, I'll have 24, 25, however many kids you have in your class slides. Um, down here in the speaker notes, I might put their name. And then that's how I know they've created their, who's creating the, the meme on here. And again, the instructions are all right there. Find your slide, right click on slide. And then it says select apply layout. So what they do is they go to apply layout and it's already populated with all these pictures that the kids get to choose from. So when we used to do memes, we used like a sketchy website where there was some, um, as it got worse, there was definitely some questionable content that we're like, well, we can't go to this website anymore. And then someone recognized that. Freememaker.com does not work. <laughs> and someone's created this beautiful little easy, safe Google Slides where, um, there we go, we'll click on this one, where you click on the picture and... Checking my pay stub after taxes. Hey, that's pretty good, man. Thank you. Thank you. I feel like um, all the ones I've ever seen, that one's actually almost funny. That's pretty good. <laughs> so again, this is something I have. So when I'm, I'm using these things, I have um, one of these in my Google Drive called Memes um, Master. So I'll make a copy of it, and then that's the one I share out. So I'm not losing, um, or I'm not I don't have to go back and edit all the pictures and take them out and redo the thing, the slides. So um, again, lots of neat ways for you to use this um, in the in the classroom. So when we're looking at um, the choice boards, um, there are other ways we can use it. So again, one of the ones that I created was for science, so wrapping up the grade eight cells and um, health units. And again, I won't go through them all, but quickly, it was more of um, a what sort of final um, inquiry project you want to do. So I'll just quick pop this open so you can see that it now becomes just a, a, a jumping board for them to figure out, okay, I wanna do heart health. Then there's their heart health, um, there's their heart health expectations for the project. Maybe they want to, they look at, they don't like it. Maybe I want to check out the GMO foods. Here's what they have to do for GMO, GMO foods. Um, so again, choice boards are just a really great little place to give student choice. And again, the great thing that we do is we cater it to our needs, but we let them have their choice so they can make it fit their needs. 
So Rich, we had a question about if you can add more pictures to the, the meme layout, which you most definitely, definitely can. Um, if you click on slide, where it says okay, the word. So, so slide, yep. yep. Oh no, that's the wrong one, sorry, wrong one. It, doesn't, it won't matter. Um, just pick any one. Um, if you click on slide, and then you can go to change, oh, edit theme, second from the bottom. Yep. And what this allows you to do is actually get into the master copy of all the slides. So you can see this is where they all have them. So what you could do is you could just add a few slides at the bottom and you could paste in your own pictures right there, um, which would allow you to do that so as well. You have one there that allows you to do that already too, so. You could do that and actually change yeah. the, the theme itself. Otherwise, the other very simple way, and it's just that little X on the top right there beside the word reapply to all. I just was struggling with that myself. Um, otherwise, the other really quick way to do it is if you want to add to them in a much, much more efficient way, you could just add some blank slides and then find the picture you want. And then when you click on the word background, which is beside the word layout there, Rich, just a little lower. Yep. And then you can go to choose image and you can now, you can either Google search it, or if you have the URL of where that picture is from and you have permission to use it, you could paste it in that way. And that would change the background of that slide as well. And I do believe that this little company, this little, um, this group here that did it, the read, um, read tech, R E tech, R or sorry, read ed tech. They have something on their website with the instructions of how to do it as well. So. Yeah, the thing about the second way is it's going to change it for that slideshow. If you do it the first way, it's going to change it for that everybody right. will have all of the <laughs> might be a little bit better. But yeah, if you're just doing it for your class, I would I would probably the second way does seem faster. Yeah. Far, far so more. When we talked about different options about, you know, maybe you don't want to do the retail and you want to do something different. We have on the next slide thrown in some other different things here as an option. So we've got the copy of a fake. Twitter account, a fictional Twitter account. So Cameron, this is sort of your thing if you want to talk to it. Yeah, yeah, really, it kind of speaks to itself. You're just taking taking one of those common things that students are know about, although I don't know if Twitter's cool anymore. <laughs> maybe even more so because of Elon Musk, maybe less so, who knows? But it just gives them a chance to kind of showcase their knowledge in a different way. Can they get snapshots of their learning? Do they know different characters that were in the story? Do they understand how this all works? So it works. It, it, they really enjoyed it as just another option. And I think it's really important to, and we keep mentioning it, just to build in choice. Maybe some students want to do Twitter. Maybe some students want to do Instagram. Maybe some students want to do like a traditional old. Da, 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 da. So whatever works best for your students. Um, Esther, if you're finding some of the links uh, need are asking you for request access, if you just private message us which ones, you can private message me or Rich. And I actually, if you private message Rich, I think he's the one with who has created some of those ones. But you can just let us know and we can make sure that those all work for you. Okay. Um, we'll do one more quick one here because we'll move on. We'll this has, Thank you. Here. This has two on. options, this one. There's a Google Draw SMS and a Google Slide SMS. And the slides is basically the exact same thing. So someone has to mute there, whoever's got their... I, I did device. it. Oh, thanks, buddy. Um, so there is a slideshow version of this as well. And that's one I would share with the whole class. This is just something that I've shared with students. So when we're reading a novel, um, text messages that characters can send back and forth. So one character, they put the name here. So it'd be Cameron. And then they put their little message back and forth here. What was really neat last year. So again, I'll use the... Um, fish in a tree example um one of the characters i think it's albert gets bullied and gets beat up and um ali and him one of my my students did them text messaging back and forth and ali's like why don't you stand up for yourself and albert's like you wouldn't understand and this message went back and forth and it showed me a bit of a deeper understanding that my student made some inferences what he got out of that little part of the book which was very small but he brought it into much more of a light for me from from his perspective so it was really neat so Again, we've done historical characters back and forth texting. Um, you know, you could do like, what would you text um, a historical character from now to then? And then they will text back and have conversations back and forth. There's lots of neat little ways to use that. Um, is there anything else that you want to show here, Cameron? Well, I think um, for inferencing, I think that's a great lead into your once to once upon a picture. If we're trying to find different ways to engage our students in uh, in writing, I find I use this quite regularly for once a week. And uh, 
Rich discovered it as a British website. And what they've done is they've taken a lot of different images and kind of created questions that can go with them. And what I love most about it is it's free. There used to be um, Pobble 365, which had 365 writing prompts a year, but then they decided that they would charge for it as well as tends mm -hmm. to happen. So I'll let Rich speak to this. Well, for me, um, it's great for, for my students with learned disabilities who, again, I talk a lot to their parents. I talk a lot to them about how I get so much more out of one week conference because they struggle getting their ideas down. They've got all these great ideas in their head and they lose someone they're trying to type or, or whatever it is that their problems are. But this, this is just a really great um, discussion point. So the one downside sometimes is the pictures can be really large. You might just have to um, zoom out a little bit to make them a bit smaller. I generally have a second computer open or I've kind of taken these questions um, and cut and paste them onto a document and maybe printed it or have it again, like I said, on my phone so I can read from it. Because it's hard to ask these questions when you want to look at the picture and you got to scroll down again. But as you can see, uh, what can you see? What do you think? What do you wonder? So a lot of really great um, discussion points there who are what smashed the glass. So we can talk about why, what, what, what do you think smashed the glass to get to the prints? Um, they're using their prior knowledge, maybe other books they've read. Why are there water droplets inside the frame? And again, what's really neat is that you start off with some very small, maybe basic answers, and then the piggyback and gets going and they just feed off each other and some really great conversations come out. Um, angry rats, there's some really neat things that we've had. They're making connections. What is this? What pictures or books or TV shows does this remind you of? Um, a couple of times we've researched, um, you know, whoever the artist is from, and we found that the, the image was taken from a book. So then we had to find the book so we could read the book. And why was that image chosen, do we think? So again, a lot of really neat little ways to go. Or you could just put this up and say, write, you know, your quick 10 minute writing in the morning. Um, just something to get the creative juices going. So again, um, onceuponapicture.co.uk, really great go-to, and they have a lot of really neat things. Do we want to get into the SD mystery, Cameron? Oh, we can just show it off. How many people, um, just type a Y in the chat if you've ever used an SD mystery. Um, oh yeah, very, very popular. All right, so we will not get into that then. We shall carry on through. Look at that. Using the knowledge in the room, top notch. All right, I'm gonna jump back to you now, sir. Beautiful. Let's jump into um slide. Well, tons of people use SM mysteries. I've now got access to the chat. Yes. All right. So I'll just share my screen. You just give me a second. Share sound. Optimize. Beautiful. All right. So we did want to offer you some bonus treats. Let me see. Yes. Here we go. So this is this. Um. If you're ever stuck for ideas one morning, you're like, I really need to do something amazing. Control Alt Achieve from Eric Kurtz is truly incredible. Um, he has got stuff that does come out almost daily. You'll notice here from today and from, or from last week on the 28th, but very, very useful, easy to use, free um, ideas. So fake news. This is a huge thing. It'd be really, really good to integrate with our students. You click on it, he tends to have Google Docs. He's even got that uh, uh, Pacific, Pacific Northwest, Northwest. That we used to do all the time. Ah, oh, all that kind of good stuff. The Explorers website that is completely fake, the Dog Island. But then it starts getting into different things like reverse image search. So it doesn't matter which thing he's talking about, it's incredible. And it includes tons and tons of webinars that are free, you can see he's been going since 2015. He had a good year in 2016. Um, and he does a newsletter. But the other thing is what's new in Google. So if you have a Google board, it is, he's he's very, very good. Um, so I always recommend that people follow him on Twitter because then he posts what is happening. Um, I don't and know so how Cameron, many I was just going to say, even if you look down the side of the website, you can see if you're looking for something in particular, his um, his his labels there are fantastic. If you need a little bit extra something in, let's say, Google Communities or Google uh, play or whatever it is. Yes, well -being. Boom. You click on it and there's a, you'll have tech tip tools and different things that you can use. Um, it's pretty awesome. So I do recommend that website. That's a place where I go when I want to try something, something new. Um, I don't know how many people remember this. Yeah. 
But that was a big part of my childhood as my parents would only let me watch TVO or PBS. And luckily, Carmen Sandiego was on one of those two channels. Um, but Carmen Sandiego came back last year with Google Earth to celebrate the release of her Choose Your Own Adventure stories on Netflix and her TV show on Netflix. And it is so Cool. It works. Uh, the new Google Earth works on Chromebooks. Like it works great on Chromebooks. It works. Um, so it's it's very accessible. You don't have to sign in. Um, and what I do, you just share these links with the students. Click begin the chase. And you may recognize this from the uh, the CD ROM game. Actually, no, it wasn't. It was like a floppy disk game that I played in like early nineties. And you are going around and you're using your knowledge of um, geography to help you do so. So if you know where the blah, 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 takes us to the different places. So this is all early 90s style, which I love, but it, it's integrated with the brand new Google Earth, which is awesome. And the great thing about this too, is it integrates all the features of Google Earth. So like Street View, so you can drop down and explore a little bit in London. And apologies if my computer's a little bit a little bit slow, but they can go street view and be in London. When we're ready to interview someone, you can go to the Tower of London and it takes you out of the street view, brings you to the Tower of London, gives you that cool overview. If you want, you can drop in on any one of the photospheres. We can learn what they're saying or they're asking about Mount Fuji. So there we are exploring the Tower of London, seeing the full experience. I don't really know much about the Tower of London. And then you can fly to see if you can figure out where the next location is. And just like the game in the early 90s, um, if you're right, you see one of the vile henchmen. And if you're wrong, you don't. I always found that the game was so hard, maybe because I was like eight or nine, but I found it so difficult and I never, ever was successful. This one is nice because you can be successful. Um, so anyways, you play through. There are three different episodes, three different mysteries that you can solve. So I found those really engaging. And if you're looking for something, especially towards the end of June there, where you're looking for something that you think would have value for students, but maybe it doesn't directly connect to something you're teaching, those three episodes are a lifesaver. Or if you have a supply teacher in. Um, yeah. There we go again. All right. Another um, interesting or fun thing that Rich and I have done with our students is using emojis to tell stories. So this year for my students in grade four, they are really struggling with writing. I think the time of the pandemic has been really, really difficult for them. Um, and they haven't really developed all of their skills for their writing. And don't get me wrong. I don't let them use emoji writing all the time. We do lots and lots of practice to build those lagging skills. But the big thing for is I want them to also feel success. So what we've been doing a little bit is writing stories or retails just using emojis. So we use a shared, um, this is what I did with my kids last year and we did a retail of a song. Um, and we used a shared slideshow. So students were able to go to Emojipedia, watch the song, read the lyrics, and then tell the story with emojis, which was so much fun. And then they were able to talk to each other and leave each other comments and feedback about what they had done so we can really work on that. So that's been so much fun. Um, this was one of my highlights was the devil went down to Georgia. He was looking for a soul to steal. Um, and then you can see right at the end, uh, there's fire on the mountain, run boy, run. Devil's in the house of the rising sun, chicken in the bread pan, picking out gold. Granny does your dog bite. No child, no. Just brilliant how they were able to use that in such a, uh, a fun way. I don't know how to move the overlay. I don't know what that means. Is that at the bottom? I uh, want of... to. Ah. Yeah. I've lost him. Yeah. One of your, uh, maybe the chat window or the participants window is over top of your slideshow. So it's grayed out. So we don't see your full slide. Oh, okay. So my, how about now? Oh, you just have to move it out of the way, maybe. There is nothing in front of it. I don't see nope. it. Nope, it's gone now. <laughs> all right, well, now I'm on the wrong slide, but I'll go back. It's all good. All right, so thank you there Peter, for keeping us on track. Um, these are the slides, and then Rich's students told Rapunzel. So just it just offers a fun and different way for students to be able to really um, share, their, share their knowledge. Um, Emojipedia is absolutely hilarious. It has all the emojis, so you can look up cat. And you go in there and what's cool about Emojipedia or what the students really like is they can find a variety of different ones depending on what they like. So if they're looking for that hyper realistic Apple style 
or really getting into that Twitter's cartoony style, they're able to do it. And some even have GIFs, which is great. And all the students would do is copy the image address and then they can insert image by the URL, paste it in, and they'll have a cap that moves. So that is so much fun. Not that it's vital to that song, but there is that. All right. Emoji is blocked by a firewall on my board. What do you suggest? Um, I don't know. I don't really re recommend Bitmoji. I, it's kind of connected to Snapchat, so I don't. I don't feel like that's really the best option for students. So perhaps something like Emojipedia. Oh, Emojipedia is or no? No, I was saying Bitmoji is, but then he said, "Oh, okay, Emojipedia." Yeah, I would, that's why I would recommend this. This is this is great. It's it's just literally an encyclopedia of all the different emojis. Um, so hopefully that's a different way to connect with that. Um, otherwise, Pixton has been a big deal in our in our board. Um, so we like choice, we like motivation, um, and we want to show you two different options um, for different ways that you could kind of bring coding first to yourself and then to your students. So um, the thing about coding is it really gives students a chance to be in control and the students who rise to the top and showcase like an aptitude for it are not always the same ones who are always successful in school. So it really, really does open up a door to some of your other learners, which is something I really like about it. Um, normally we would be going and we would spend 20 minutes on this, but our goal today is to finish around about 5.30 as these are supposed to be around about an hour. So I wanna show you how you can access all of this learning, um, but again, honor your time and say like it's 5.30 and you're probably starving. So I get that too. So. One thing to know is if you're going to do Scratch, having a, an educator account is vital because then you can create a class. And if you have a class, you can create usernames for all your students so that in my, in my class, all my students are 4-1 Stealth 1, 4-1 Stealth 2, 4-1 Stealth 3, et cetera. Um, and the reason being this way, Scratch gets no personal information from my students. It doesn't know their names. It doesn't know their ages. It gets nothing, which is one way in which we can keep um, our board happy for the way the um, privacy collects. So to become an educator, you just click on teacher accounts and boom, request a teacher account. And then you can set up a classroom and really um, you can't collaborate on projects, but you can create like a studio where all the students can work in. Um, so I highly recommend getting an account just so you can play with it on your own. Fun thing about Scratch, though, is no one has to have an account to participate. If a student just came to you and they've got no way in, it's no big deal. They can create. The only downside is if you create and do not have an account, you can't save or share your project with anyone else. Um, today, though, um, or for the future. Um, we have two different videos that, that allow you to, um, one is to create a rock band, and I'll show you what that looks like. This is the project we created, and it's it does smoke on the water. Um, so we built this together last year. You can see inside how simple it is. It's a great program to start with. When I press E, we hear an electric guitar play E. When I press B, we hear B. So if I click play, I should be able to play the opening chords to smoke on the water and I hope you can hear them. And then I would do that five more times and you would be truly blown away at my incredible guitar playing <laughs> ability. Uh, love that song. So this video will walk you or your students directly through the entire process for how, thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, um, how you could actually do that. It's it's only eight minutes long. So again, perfect. They pause, my students pause it, they watch it, they do it, they come back. And it's it's been really, really good. Um, but again, in the honor of choice for my students as well, I never just say there's just one thing. Here's the other one. And this is kind of a CS first um, uh, idea. And what it allows you to do is just animate your own name. So uh, if you do this, it will walk, it starts you out with a basic plain program. And if you go to Google CS first, which you, if you haven't seen, I highly recommend, even if it happens to be in Spanish, um, it has got a whole bunch of different ways that you can make your name or the letters in your name do really cool things. Um, one thing I love about, <laughs> one thing I love about Scratch is that every time I'm doing something in a new project, 
I learned something that I can transfer over to things I've done in the past. And it really, I just, I'm always impressed with how much better I am getting at being a, being coding on scratch and my students too. They are now even like my grade fours, they are creating things that are truly, truly <laughs> incredible. And while I can't code quite as well as Peter yet, um, I am, I've got, I, I can do okay here. In right. Scratch. So that's what it sounds like with my old voice in there. Um, just the last thing I will share about coding is I have also, as a part of my master's program, one goal was to create a course. And the course I created was on getting going with coding. So this, if you sign up with your email, it's completely free. Canvas is just the, the host of the program. It's actually a, a how-to of getting started with Scratch. So there's about five or six different programs you can teach your students, how-to videos, tutorials, um, it's all right in there. So it may be something if you wanted to kind of push yourself further or share with someone who you're like, oh, they'd really like to learn a little bit more about coding. Maybe you have them enroll and explore in that. Can you drop that link in, Cam? I can. Yeah, that's a great idea. Sorry. Just, just so I make sure that it's in the show notes. Yeah, for sure. Um, copy link address and send to everyone. Can you use this with students or use the bit.ly for us first? Uh, you can definitely use this with students. Um, all the videos, I, I, you know what I will do is I will just share it with you. So just give me one second. I'm not trying to enroll. I think I can just sign in and I'll show you exactly what that course looks like. So this was the program, da, 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 getting going with coding. And this is what it would look like as a student view. So once you log in, it looks like this. You see my goofy little face waving um, and you click on modules to get started. Inside of here, we can see um, how to create an account, how to get help or questions. You can just use that. Why do we code? And you move on. So you can see here's the animating your name thing that we talked about. And here's a wide variety of student examples of different remixes they've done and a full tutorial list. As we go in deeper, it goes a little bit more specific on specific projects you could do with your students. So this is how we do choose your own adventure stories. Or for math, we were doing probability. This is a fruit ninja game that allows students to do their fruit ninjing, like it uses video sensing. Um, and this was smoke on the water. So this is the pro, it's it's completely free and it is there for you if uh if yeah, if you if you wanted to sign up for it, I think if I leave student view, I can also get the link so that you can come back to it at any time. Because once you've logged in once, then you have to just sign. Then you just sign in like I just did, and it'll be a part of your courses, so you'll be all good there. Beautiful. All right. Then, cool, yeah. yeah. So this is the link, the short link to do it, and that's the link to jump back into it anytime. And that is the Grateful Dead further bus, which is sweet. All right. Mr. Parker, we've got 11 minutes. Do you want to teach right. something about digital art? Digital art. So this is um, something that we found last year. So I'm going to take over the screen share again. Um, when we were at home last week, last year, last week, um, or if you're teaching virtually this year, or if you just want something to do that takes the students, you know, gives them an opportunity to get away from the paper and digital using some digital art. Um, we found a bunch of things that we curated, um, but one school board in particular, curated a whole bunch of stuff. So if we go to the digital art site, I believe this is it. It takes us to this, this has been board. an absolute lifesaver when I yeah. don't have an art lesson. And they've added more this year too. So this school board here has all these amazing pieces of art that can be all done with just using Google Draw or Google Slides. And I'll do a quick little example sometime in a few minutes. As we can scroll down, you can see Bob Ross there makes an appearance in the minimalist celebrity portrait. My students really enjoyed this atmospheric one over here. Um, and, you know, some are really simple, some are super creative and challenging, um, and they bring in a lot of really cool different thoughts. The mosaic one was one that was cool, um, took some time uh, for students to be a bit more perseverance. Um, some word art, and again, like I said, they've added a ton of those creating symmetry right there. Um, the tints and tone, I, yeah, there's just so much great stuff. I know a lot of people really like this uh, tints and tone value composition one. I saw that one of the LD classes have done that in grade four and five. 
my <laughs> my students really liked the animal dress up one uh, as well last year. And again, I, I'm just going to scroll right down. I think there's over 180 ideas now up there. I'm getting a bit dizzy watching this, Rich. <laughs> you got like two. You got like two years of three years of art right here for you. So, or are you just there's 180. You can do one art lesson every single day for your whole there school. There you go. <laughs> so, what I did because my students um, needed um, some visual, some video um, lessons to walk through this. So on the top one where it says my site, um, I created. I'm just gonna move you. Can we get your picture up? There we go. I created some, um, let me do the digital mosaic here. So if you click on that, it kind of walks through how to do that. So I put together what complementary colors are, a value scale, and then I put a video on how to create that art. Um, the other really cool thing actually I didn't show you from that website, so I'm gonna go back to it, sorry, is that when you pick a piece of art that you want to do, they give you the template and the instructions for it. Again, with my students learn disabilities, um, it was just a little wordy, some of them. They'd like to see the visualization of it. So I would create, and also it helped me if they needed help know what to do. Yeah. So if we wanted to do Value City, I click on Value City. And it takes me there and it gives me the templates. Oh, Which sure. I picked, one that, I picked the wrong one. <laughs> I picked the one that doesn't have a template. I'd say 60% of them have amazing, amazing resources that go with them. And 40%, you're like, well, that's annoying. I really wish I knew how they did this. This would have been. I think Shattered Value does. Yeah, I think it does too. I've done that with my students. Yeah. Just trying to open. But yeah, for the most part, go. they do have this one's great because it teaches the element of design. Yeah. yeah. So here it is right here. So if I click on this here, it opens up a copy. It opens up um, the Google Drawing with the instructions of how to create it. So it gives you the example here. And I, see how I see, you know, like for my kids with learning disabilities, this, this is all too much for them to together. So I took that and extrapolated it and made it into a video for them, as well as I broke the steps down on my little website there um, one by one. So I would put the instructions underneath here. Um, oh, not that one, of course. So there's my examples that we did there. So how do we do this? So what I'm going to do just quickly is I'm going to open up a Google Drive. Do you ever worry that you don't have enough tabs? Hey, this is nothing. I've had that like concern for you. It was like I only have 1,200 open today. I finding the next thing seems very simple. I close this computer down. So. One of the things that um, we talked about was changing gradients. So and another tool that's really useful on um, when you're doing a lot of these, you know, going through Bob Ross's head or whatever is this polyline tool. So if I insert an image from the web, so that's how we start. So if I do Will Smith was what I did last year for someone. So Will Smith, if I bring Will Smith over here like this and I've got him in there, what you do is so let's say I wanted to make him a little more into a vector it's called I'm going to take the polyline and I'm going to just kind of do his hair here so I close this off by going all the way around his head and we talked with the, my students because eventually that image is going to disappear as I make my cartoon or vector version of him so it doesn't matter if you've made it perfect or not so you can see how there's his hair First thing I always teach them is to get rid of the, the outline. Whatever color you change it to, it's going to stay that way. Then the other thing that's neat is, so now I've got, um, I've taken off the, the, the line, the poly line. I've got the box around his hair. So now I'm gonna change the color. So I like playing with the gradients. So you can do custom colors. Um, it's really big in a lot of the art on the digital line, uh, the digital website. So if I want to make it like orangey, so then I'm gonna add, and I'm going to change the color here, make it a bit more red. And I can adjust what that color is going to look like. So as I move this circle down, you can see the red head up. If I move it this way, you can see the red change down. And then maybe I'm going to add one more here. And I'm going to make it a little yellow. And I'm going to take this one here. So you can really mess around with different types of um, tones and colors and everything. So I move Students this way. love this. Yeah. So now I go, be, okay. This happens at the end of the lesson. <laughs> right. 
I go, okay. And you can see it's changed his hair. It looks like Dennis Rodman. <laughs> That's an amazing. So then I go back to Polyline. Um, sorry, where's my shit? There it is there. I go back to my Polyline and maybe I want to do, you know, around his eyes and so on. So you kind of get the idea that I would change that color to something else. Maybe I'll make that gray in the background. Maybe I'll give him sunglasses. You know, so you're changing all sorts of neat little parts of whatever image you're using. When you're done, that's why I tell the kids it doesn't really matter if you haven't done it perfectly. You move his shape away and get rid of it. Move his head. There we go. And it leaves an eventual Bob Ross or whoever they choose to do as a celebrity. Um, a really neat one was like we built this city, which is like doing like a Miami Beach style scene. And you do the buildings and silhouettes of palm trees, and then they flip them and reverse them so that it looks like a reflection in the water. So there's lots of, again, like I said, really neat things in this website um that gave us digital art options when we were at home and we have continued to use them in the classroom as well some of the other ones i did here were just messing around with pixlr so uh, my students really wanted to do pixlr lunapic and photomosh so they were creating like these really interesting glitch art things last year um so we walked through again of how to do that so you can see the different outcomes. There's Will Smith again. That was a theme last year because that's what my kids kept wanting me to, to do. Um, so again, videos on how to do it as well. So a lot of really neat things that we chose to do digitally um, last year that you can still do in the classroom this year. Um, One thing, too, Rich, I just like to we just like to say too that Google Draw is just an underutilized resource. It can be so so phenomenal, and I that's what I love so much about this digital art teacher who was willing to give all this stuff away for free. Is he's really reawakened my excitement about using Google Draw. When you're done on a Google drawing too, one thing that we really like to do is you can file download as a PNG, so it gives you an image you can then put right onto your website. It is. Awesome. You then have something that students are like, oh, now I've got this image or JPEG or PNG, whatever one you prefer. And then once you have it, it can go right onto your website. So my students build websites for themselves to showcase their best work. And so their art projects now go into an image carousel with every piece of work that they've done. And it's been I just created this one quickly. Really cool. So there it is there quickly. I downloaded the PNG. You can see what it looks like. So again, that's file, download, and that is a PNG. And then it's there for them to do. Yeah. So um, some other things that we're just, I know that we're pushed for time. So I'll just highlight a couple of things here on our site. Um, what's really neat is remove BG and erase BG. What those do is um, if you've got a picture where like, for example, we found this B with like um, a flower behind it, but we just wanted to use the B, um, it will take the background as long as it isn't too close to the picture and like makes it look like it's part of the picture. It will get rid of the whole background and turn it into a transparency. We just um, continue to um, hope that you continue to follow the copyright laws and use pictures that are available to be modified for your, your work. Uh, once those backgrounds are removed, you can upload them as sprites into Scratch, and then you can use them for all sorts of amazing projects. So removebot.bg is one of my students' favorite things. Yeah. Like, oh, I found this picture, copyright, I hope, and then did that. It's great. There's some of the, we built this city, so... Not exactly the best um, squares there, but I guess there's silhouettes of hotels and you can see the palm trees. So there's another one you can see how, and this is really neat because they played with the reflection saying, well, you don't always see the full reflection in the, in the ocean, Mr. Parker. I'm like, you're right, you don't. And then they also learned to keep like a bit of the beach between the, the hotel and so they wouldn't have it right up against the water because the beach is exactly right on the water. So it's just neat little things that we talked through when we were creating these that help kids realize some things too. So perspective. Anything else, Cam? No, man. Slide 22. Click on her. Slide 22. Oh, right. There we go. So we want to say thank you all so much. We are exactly on our time, which I'm impressed with. Um, and if you get a chance to explore and you have any questions, do feel free to email either Rich or I, or uh, you can direct message us on Twitter. Um, we are totally, totally fine with that. There's, we know it's an overabundance of resources, but our thing is if we throw a whole bunch of stuff at you, one thing will hopefully stick. And then if that thing, you can try one new thing. So that's always our goal. Um, Rich, they, do, can, you, can you explain Lego right to build in less than 30 seconds? Um, you know, I, I can, well, basically what I used to do was um, the students needed something to build. So we had a theme where they had to build four different pictures, um, take pictures of them. And then there was always an, an ape writing picture. I, you know, I can explain it better anew 
um, if you wanted to email me or message me on Twitter, I can explain it better with sort of typed out instructions. It's, it was engaging. And I gave the kids the option to, to draw, to build instead of just um, sort of draw to write instead of just building to write because some kids wanted to draw instead of build Lego. But there was always a theme and some questions. And I took it from like the Lego education um, kit that I had bought, the school had bought for me where it has some of these things in there depending on curriculum grade and stuff like that. So I can share with you um, some of that stuff if you just message me privately. She's going to, that's perfect. And Peter perfect. Jeremy was wondering when the recording will be available. Okay, I'll address that. Gorgeous. All right. Well, we are. I, I. We are really appreciative of all your kind comments, but really, we we are just kind of sharing things that have worked for us, and we just think it's so amazing that you're here. So, really, all thanks to the people who have participated and joined us. We really, really are glad you found it meaningful. And if you do need anything, we are here for you. And the next time, I will have a headset. The camera's going to send me one if it's not the one mine's broken. You got it, amigo. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. We really appreciate your time. That was um, overwhelming. <laughs> Do you know what? This shouldn't have been a 30 minute presentation. This should have been 15 minutes per day for the entire school year. Quite honestly, like I could imagine, you know, like a, a daily tweet or a daily email with like one resource for everybody to experiment with, because I'm sure that at the end of this, everyone's just going to shake their head going, oh, where do I start? Like one you thing, <laughs> just one thing. We don't care which one thing. Yeah. Um, I think even in the show notes, like, you know, like I really, all I can say to people is start with the presentation and just, you know, uh, and just go through it and experiment, try, right. It was overwhelming. Um, <laughs> totally, totally inspirational. In a good way though, right, Peter? In a good oh, way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, where do you start? Right. Where, where do you start? What's the first one that you pick? Uh, that's, slide that's four. Challenge. I go to slide four and then from there I work my way down to five. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, so, so my my job now is I'm going to take the show notes or create the show notes and send them back to OTF and um, and quickly edit the video um, and then again send that to OTF. Um, you will probably if Jason, so that's his name there, if if he is on it tomorrow, you'll receive an email before the end of the day, and you'll have the link to the evaluation form. Although I just dumped it in the chat, so I would appreciate if you know perhaps before you walk away from your computer, if you could fill in the, uh, the feedback form, uh, a link to oh it says Elizabeth. Sorry, that's the danger of copy and paste. Um, so you'll get the link to the slide deck if you don't already have it. And you've already got that. And before we go, I just want to give a plug for two things on the OTF website. One is um, the PD calendar. I'm finding this is something that many teachers aren't aware of. So if you want to take a qualification course like an AQ or an ABQ, instead of going around to the different faculties of ed or the different unions and seeing what they offer, you can just go to the PD calendar. And uh, if you just Google like OTF PD calendar, you'll find it right off and you can search for the category that you're interested in. It'll it'll bring up a list of uh, everything that's there. So, for instance, this month, you know, there's over there's over even though it's just the spring term, there's over 200 courses being offered. And in the summertime, there's easily over around 600 courses being offered. And the other plug I want to give is for the OTF uh, YouTube channel. So that's where these videos are going to be uh, posted. Actually, I'll drop a link in right now for both of those. Yep, so um, all the webinars that have appeared, so this is number 12 out of 14 of this series, all of them appear there along with all the show notes. So if you forget, just go there and perhaps subscribe. So that way when new uh, new ones are posted, you'll uh, get a notification. And uh, that's it for me. Oh, um, next, next webinar is next Tuesday. So we take a break this Thursday because normally they're Tuesdays and Thursdays. Uh, so providing subject-focused leadership. So if you haven't signed up, uh, please do.